thanking the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, tell you about uh, our uh, latest results in our Itlebium, uh, uh, lab in Florence regarding coherent association and control of uh, uh, orbital flashback molecules in two electron atoms. So the work uh, has been done in collaboration between uh, CNR, uh, National Institute of Optics, and LENS. And um, for those of you who may not be so confident with two electron atoms, let's m let me just remind the basics. So two electron atoms uh, just feature two electrons in the other shell, which can couple in, uh, with zero and one spin. So this gives rise to typical uh, helium-like level structure. This is very feeble, but um, where you have two uh, independent level sets, more or less. So besides having uh, strong, allowed, uh, strong and allowed uh, dipolar transition, then you have also uh, intercombination and uh, transition, which are good not only for cooling, but also for manipulating the internal degrees of freedom, as, as, uh, as, you show, as I'll show you in a while. And also, you have this clock transition, connecting these 1 and 0 and 3p0 levels, uh, which, uh, provided that you have the right technology in the lab, allows you to use this uh, long-lived metastable state as a sort of additional ground state of the system. So uh, in the lab, <coughs> um, mm, we do have this technology. We have a laser which is able to make uh, line widths uh, below 100 hertz. Uh, and also we uh, were able to observe a coherent oscillation in the population between the ground state and the orbital state. And um, uh, I also like to mention the second important property of these systems. Uh, focusing on Itabium now, uh, all of the fermionic, fermionic isotopes have only nuclear spin in the ground state and also in the first uh, orbital state. So this gives you uh, um, the so-called SUN symmetry in terms of interactions. This means that interaction strength between uh, atoms are the same independently on, on any mixture you are taking. This in turn delivers the important property of having no spin changing collisions. This is uh, uh, really important and really different with respect to any other alkali-like uh, system, where typically only few uh, uh, com configurations in terms of spin are stable against rel relaxation. So, uh, in the lab, we can prepare one component gas, namely ideal Fermi gas, up to a six component gas interacting. So, in the following, we'll focus on SU2 symmetric uh, mixture composed by plus and minus five halves uh, atoms. Okay, so, uh, the interplay between the nuclear spin and electronic orbital degrees of freedom gives you a strong, uh, a very rich uh, physical system in terms of collision of physics. So you can have uh, two spinful levels, and you can play around with the composition in terms of spin and also in coupling between the, the, the ground and the orbital level. Okay? So that's the reason why in the last years, uh, very few years, a lot of attention has been uh, sparked uh, around these kind of systems. I have no time uh, uh, to, to go through all details, but uh, this morning we saw a nice talk by Matteo uh, regarding the synthetic ladders with dimension, uh, sorry, with the interactions. And uh, for uh, this talk, uh, it's sufficient to say that uh, uh, what I'm going to tell you is more or less focused on uh, um, the route towards the observation of uh, uh, a fuzzy crossover in the BCS, BCBCS crossover um, in multi-orbital systems, okay? So, um, recently, uh, the Peng Zhang group in China uh, pointed out the possibility to exploit, or, or at least the existence of, a, of, a, of an orbital fascia resonance, which is a sort of uh, different kind of uh, fascia resonance involving uh, uh, two atoms. Actually, the open channel here is represented by a ground state atom in spin up, and one orbitally excited at atom spin down. So the closed channel is the opposite. Uh, actually, um, the difference with respect to the standard, let's say, flashback resonance, is that now the coupling mechanism uh, uh, giving you the evolved crossing is the spin exchange interaction rather than the uh, hyperfine mixing. So uh, we recently were, uh, have been able to detect this uh, kind of interaction also in a coherent way. So the interaction is there. And now, uh, uh, okay, uh, we turned in, in trying to find this resonance. So initially what scared us a lot was that uh, actually the magnetic field tunability is very feeble because of the fact that you have only nuclear spin. But now the magic is done by Itabium, which is very special, uh, Itabium 173, because uh, it features a very, very shallow bound state 10 kilohertz be below the closed uh, channel threshold. So this means that uh, this is small, but also this energy is small. So in principle, it should be possible for us to tune magnetically the two molecular levels 
analogously to the standard fashion resonance, in order to observe a scattering resonance. And this is exactly what we measured some years ago. So you see here that around a very low fields, convenient fields of 40, 50 Gauss, uh, we were able to drive the system in a strongly interacting regime. Interestingly, <coughs> uh, if we uh, perform the same experiment uh, for different spin mixtures, like this, 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 and the others, then the position of the, cen the center uh, of the resonance is just shifting. Okay? This is not surprising, because if you then replot the data set as a function of a rescale magnetic field, where you take into account the, the magnetic uh, um, let's say sensitivity difference of uh, each of the pair uh, you are uh, probing, then all of the data set collapsed to a single feature. So this is witnessing the underlying uh, um, SUN symmetric character of, of our system in interactions. Okay, uh, so let me uh, now combine the three ingredients I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. So the orbital fascia resonance, the orbital and nuclear degrees of freedom in order to show you how is it possible to uh, use them to create a degenerate sample of molecules, orbital molecules, uh, which you can also uh, coherently address uh, in terms of different spin configurations. Okay, uh, let's start with a three-dimensional lattice filled by atoms, uh, two spins, okay? Uh, some of the sites will be filled by two atoms in spin up and spin down. So the idea now is to shine a clock pulse. Oh, sorry. The idea is to... Sh shine a clock pulse, and try to see if it's possible to drive this mechanism, driving two unbound atoms in a bound pair. So here, uh, the zero crossing is obviously uh, given by the position of the uh, flashback resonance. So uh, these are the results. Let's focus on the uh, light blue, for example, which are uh, data taken at 15 recoils as uh, lattice depth. Uh, you see here that we have two prominent features. So the big peak is the standard uh, uh, clock spectroscopy. So this process just uh, brings one ground state atom into an orbit, orbitally excited level, okay, still in the ground state of the lattice. So instead, this additional peak is exactly uh, uh, addressing the um, mechanism I was uh, telling you before. So here we are bringing atoms from unbound to bound. Okay? And actually, <coughs> this difference is uh, uh, indeed given by the sum of the on-site interaction energy, which is easily calculatable, or uh, we can even measure, we, we did this, plus the binding energy. Mm? Then uh, we also replicated these measurements as a function of magnetic field and also for different values of uh, uh, trapping, uh, lattice depth. And I have no time to go through the details, just uh, uh, trust me. So we use uh, a model in order to fit our data to extract the value for the closed channel scattering length. So just a, a hint here, so this value is much bigger than the uh, background um, O, uh, open channel scattering length. And this difference is exactly what's giving rise to the spin exchange mechanism when two atoms approach each other. So now something fun. So we try to keep the laser in resonance and shine a clock pulse. And this is what's happening. So we uh, were able to observe a coherent oscillation between bound and unbound pairs, which lasts for several oscillation cycles. So this, besides being uh, interesting by itself, it's also useful for us because uh, it allows us to make a pi pulse with a clock laser in order to associate the molecular sample. Mm? So these molecules are a mixture of ground state and orbitally excited atoms. Huh? So they are a funny, funny guy. Okay, I don't know why it's skipping. Okay, um, now let me come back to the spinful situation. So uh, as I uh, already told you, we can think our system in terms of uh, several possible spin, spin configurations and also a molecule can be created, or at least can exist in different spin configurations. So there are sort of spin isomers, and the, um, obviously they rely on the different uh, binding energy branches. Uh, and also here, the reason is that, as I showed you in the orbital fascial resonance slide, uh, the orbital fascial resonance center just depends on the uh, particular spin arrangement you are dealing with. But the point is that the underlying SUN symmetry gives you an easy way of retrieving one binding energy once you know the other. Because you simply can just use the rescale form for the magnetic field, exactly as we did for the uh, position of the centers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so once you put uh, these guys in the, in the field, then you should also be able, be able by shining a pair of uh, uh, laser beams with proper detuning uh, to address the spin flipping transition, not only in the atomic case, but also 
in the molecular example, okay? And if you do things in the right way, also a coherent, let's say, mm, dynamics should be, uh, should be possible. So this is uh, uh, more or less what we try to uh, search for. So the experiment is performed as follows. Again, we perform uh, um, association of molecules, this time with a clock bipulse. Mm -hmm. And then we perform RAMA spectroscopy, and incoherent RAMA spectroscopy on the sample. And uh, this is the data set we got. So you see here that we have uh, two strong peaks. Actually, these peaks are the single atom peaks, just flipping uh, the spin of single atoms, or better, of atoms trapped in the singly occupied sites of the lattice. Okay? And uh, uh, they are not degenerate because of uh, uh, the residual light shift induced by the Raman beam themselves. Otherwise, they would be absolutely degenerate there. And the interesting guy is this peak. So this peak corresponds to a bound-to-bound -bound transition in the molecular sample. So this peak corresponds to this process, bringing this uh, pair here to this pair here. So we are just navigating through uh, different, let's say, spin isomers. And incidentally, this energy difference here is exactly the energy difference between the, let's say, the difference between the binding energies of the two uh, spin configuration. Again, we can try to keep the laser on resonance here. Now we keep the Raman uh, set of lasers in resonance. And uh, um, again, we observe a dynamic uh, a dynamics which is coherent. Okay, so we have a long uh, lived and coherent uh, flopping between different molecular configurations. Mm? Okay, uh, I told you many body uh, the first in the first part of, of my talk. The first thing we try to do in order to assess whether our system is truly uh, suitable for many body physics is to see how much these molecules la live into the, into the lattice. So we start from uh, the three-dimensional configuration, so where molecules are more or less isolated from uh, each other. So you have no, let's say, collision in short times here. And this is the number we, get, we got. So we observe a rather long lifetime of the order of the 350 milliseconds. Actually, here, the main limiting factor is the lattice tunneling. So this time is comparable to le lattice tunneling time. Uh, uh, um, in this time, a molecule can just uh, hop on the other side and just recombine with the other. Just Delivering to, delivering to atom loss. Then, instead of having a 3D configuration, just released two of the three beam uh, pairs in order to arrange a, a, a stack of molecular pancakes. So this is a, a many-body configuration. In each of the pancakes, you have many molecules which are free to move and interact. So this gives hints on how molecules live in a many-body environment. So uh, fortunately, we are already uh, able to see something approaching 100 milliseconds, which is not so short. It starts to be comparable with the typical experimental times for many radio physics. But then also, you have to take into account the fact that we, we don't have a pristine and pure molecular sample. So we have many atoms remaining for technical reasons. Uh, uh, so actually, this is a good point, because this is the main, so the atom molecule loss here is the main limiting factor. And uh, we expect, once we clean the sample, to have much longer lifetime. If you only have, would have molecule-molecular uh, um, interaction, which are polyprotected, okay? So I instead, if you have atom-molecule losses, obviously, you have no protection from the Pauli principle. So this is a lower limit, and I think that this is a rather good starting point for uh, studies on the CBCS crossover in this multi-orbital <coughs> system. Okay, incidentally, uh, we also try to uh, have some hint on uh, how this lifetime behaves as a function of magnetic field across the resonance. And uh, um, as we expected, since we, have main we are mainly limited by atom-molecule interactions uh, and losses, we don't observe any uh, typical trend, which is uh, instead typical in the unitarity regime if we would have only, for example, molecule-molecule uh, interaction. Okay. So these are the conclusions. I hope to have convinced you that uh, our system is rather promising in terms of many body physics and also precision measurements because we uh, could measure molecular sample with rather long lifetime and we could also coherently address their intrinsic properties. Let me just make a five second digression on a, another experiment, just single slide. Um, I'm also involved in a, a new experiment of uh, magnetic dysprosium uh, in collaboration with PISA. So we recently uh, had nice results on uh, observation of uh, 
let's say, stable stripe phase uh, in this degenerate sample. So if, if you are interested in dipolar physics, just stay tuned on the archive because we are preparing the submission in, in some days. And uh, I would like, obviously, to thank all the team, not only the Brazilian the legacy, which is Leonardo, me, uh, Lorenzo Frank, and Daniel uh, Benedicto Renes, but mostly the guys with our, which are overseas still working hard in the lab. And uh, if you're interested in more details on what I told you, and also on former experiments in, uh, on Ethereum, just uh, please uh, take a look to the two posts that we have. Uh, Lorenzo Frank and Daniel Lorenz will be hap hap happy to, to answer to your question. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Well, thank, thanks a lot for your nice talk. Uh, actually, I have one question. Uh, when you switch on the clock or, or the Raman for certain du time durations, these oscillations, and I, I wonder what is the zero and what is the one there? Kind of, you always say there is 